project, and he's going to help us make sense of our real-time data. Hopefully, people aren't too hungover at this point. Smidge. Smidge. All right. All right. So, sort of about me. Um, I'm with the Hunnet Project. Um, been with them, I don't know, four or five years now. Long enough, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, have a research interest in well, data visualization, data distribution, and uh, data processing. Um, over the years, I've collected quite a bunch of, bitches, a bunch of data and just trying to figure out what to do with it and make any sense of it has been, well, interesting and fun. Um, I'm doing data visualization as part, as part of SmooCon Labs for the past uh, few years, probably four. Um, and as a day job, I uh, do network security research for a uh, federally funded research and development center. Um, so, for those, those of you who don't know uh, what the Honeynut Project is, the Honeynut Project is a uh, nonprofit computer security research organization um, founded in uh, 2000 by uh, Lance Spitzler. Um, it's a uh, it's global membership of uh, volunteers with uh, diverse skill sets uh, and experience. Um, all the tools and research that we do, we make uh, freely available, um, so people like you can make use of them in your uh, in your research or your um, in protecting your networks or however you want to use them. So what exactly is this talk about? So with the data visualization work I've done in labs, we've, we've used quite a few different number of tools. We've had some luck, we've had luck with some and not so good luck with others. Um, also with the amount of people, uh, the amount of traffic happening over this network here, um, sometimes these tools can get overwhelmed. Um, and so this is sort of going over the lessons learned we've had with actually tr trying to do data visualization here. Um, and just to preface something, um, I, the goal of my data visualization is always to sh just show the data and make it as, make, to offer awareness to people to um, mainly act as a conversation starter so you can teach them more. So I don't know how many people here know anything about data visualization. Okay. Uh, one thing I bet that I can guarantee just about everyone in here has done at least some form of it. Um, so to start with, we'll go with nice basic stuff. So you get your standard graphs. Bar graphs, line graphs, pie graphs, scatter plots. <laughs> uh, odds are everyone in here has done at least one of those at some point. Uh, now we get into more interesting stuff. We've got link graphs. Uh, these work really well for showing relationships between two nodes. Um, though you get a lot of data, it becomes a mess and you can't see anything. And this is where um, filtering your data down either to a subset or getting rid of noise uh, comes in handy. Um, you get heat maps. Um, the specific example is um, heat maps with uh, geolocated related data. Um, this is showing Senders of spam hitting a particular spam uh, spam trap. Spam trap. Um, again, this is something that you have to also be careful with uh, this type of map because um, occasionally this will end up looking like a population map because most places where they have lots of people they have lots of computers, and odds are half of them are about to infect, infected sending out stuff. Now, data sources. There's a quite different few ways you can get your data to uh, actually generate your graphs or, uh, or just doing your analysis. Uh, in labs, we started with using PCAPs because uh, it's nice, easy to get, um, and contains a lot of data. Uh, but once you get to, I don't know, 2,000 people on the network, um, yeah, it gets to be about too much data. Um, and the tools start having uh, problems processing it in a timely manner. Um, we started running into a problem uh, with a program called GLTAB, which I'll talk more about later, um, where 
we would run the capture and then shut it off, and GLTEL would keep on running for hours and hours and hours. Uh, it was that far behind. Uh, so next, this is so last year I started looking into using Grow IDS uh, to Ooh. help <laughs> to help deal with that. Um, how many people in here have used Grow? All right. Um, so, Bro does a great job of taking, your da taking the data stream and summarizing it. Um, it has lots of different protocol decoders and can get you a um, good amount of information just from that. Um, uh, yeah, and it, this also decreases the amount of data that your tools have to actually end up processing in the end or at least allows you to focus more on um, specifically what you're looking to get out of it. So, what we've we done at ShmooCon over the past years? To start with, we basically used Ether8. It's like a spam port connection to it. Um, we would display source and destination uh, of the traffic uh, and draw a link between them with uh, link between them as the communications occur, and then the color of the link would, would denote what application was used. Um, and the size of the link would be the amount of data transfer. Uh, the links would um, reduce in size over time and eventually disappear depending upon uh, configuration and all that. Now this worked well for, for a while, but after a few years as the column got bigger, it wasn't practical. Uh, to make this thing even remotely intelligible, you have things up there for maybe one or two seconds before you have to clear them out because it was just a jumbled mess. You couldn't even make out what IPs were on there. So we then went on to a tool called uh, NetProc. Uh, this came out, this was a, uh, I believe this was a Google Summer of Code project. Um, it's actually quite an interesting tool. Um, to sort of explain how it works. Uh, in the center there, there's the local system that's actually reading the traffic, and then within the dotted circle are all the systems that are on the local subnet. Um, outside the dotted circle are all the systems that aren't on the local subnet. Um, and you're able to uh, group um, the dots on the outside together by a um, CIDR address, which proved be useful because you can group things like Google, Facebook ID addresses as long as you need the IP space. Uh, and just get a general good idea of uh, who was going to. To start with, we were using just a um, wireless sniffer uh, where the visualization system was set up. Um, worked well for that. The following year, we hooked it up to the span connection and it crashed immediately. Uh, so you did raise just, well, we're sending too much data. Uh, program is written in Java, so. Uh, but yeah. So for the past few years, if you've ever been around labs, you've probably seen this. Uh, this is GLTail. Uh, so each blob on the screen indicates a um, an event that happens in, in the logs. Um, and you can define these events based upon the uh, parsers uh, that it uses. It comes with a bunch of parsers for different applications, so like Apache, Ruby and Rails, MySQL, PFSense, a uh, bunch of others. Uh, this particular graph is uh, visualizing the early stages of a um, like a VoIP attack, uh, actually a VoIP honeypot. And so for ShmooCon, we used the C Shark uh, parser, and so this we just spun up T Shark, had it dump the output to a text file, and GLTEL read it. Um, and as I said, this would, you could run it for about, you can run the capture for about an hour. You shut off the capture and the, the visualization will keep on going for like the next three to four hours. Um, so with all that, and I need to slow down because I'm running the slides. And I'm only 10 minutes in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what's new with data distillation? So originally I was going to actually have a, what, um, what I've been working on running in labs. Unfortunately, the 
laptop I had there wouldn't cooperate, or more like Ruby wouldn't cooperate, uh, and so I couldn't get some of the programs running in time. So you guys get to see here instead. Um, so in the past, we've only used spam ports as our um, data source. So starting last year, I decided to switch to Bro IDS logs. Uh, the goal was to switch over this year. Um, so none of the existing tools we had could uh, understand Bro. Um, and so I had to, well, make new parsers or modify the tools. And so uh, I designed, so for GLTEL, I went ahead and made um, four parsers for some of the logs. I made parsers for the, con log, the connection log, the DNS log, the HTTP log, and the SSL log. Um, so, and the preface is also, GLTEL does support custom parsers, uh, which is quite handy. It takes a little while to figure out how to do that, but it's, it's not that difficult once you understand the format. So, to give you an idea of what this looks like now, I'm going to go ahead and show you. And I'm hoping this works because the past few times I've tested this, it crashes about a few seconds in. If it doesn't, I'm going to do it off. So, I'm doing this with live con data. Um, so, I'm actually going to be connecting to the bureau sensor in the labs uh, and showing you what it sees. Uh, if that crashes too often, I'm going to switch over to a, re a local replay of last year's logs. Come on. That's what I want. And that. And yeah. We'll see how long it goes for. Um, so here I have source and destination IPs on each side. Uh, that's in the orange and green. Um, I'm showing the uh, what protocol each connection is and what Bro thinks the application is. Uh, then I pull from the HTTP logs um, what domains are being go are being go to, uh, people are going to, and then from the SSL logs I'm pulling out. Uh, what cipher suites is being selected, and what version of SSL is being used. Yeah, I think I'm hitting a bug in that SSH uh, gem. Now, anyone have any questions at this point? Yeah. Yes, for the, only for the connections. Uh, so the source and destination IP, I set, I set it so that um, the, so, yeah, so I would set the, um, made the parser so to grab the size and represent that with the dot, how big the dot is. Everything else is just, it's arbitrary. Okay, Dave. Yep. Could you explain what the length of it is? Like, what, what are it really looking at as far as like, the, the difference between the connections? The difference between like each side or? Yeah, each side. That's just the way I said it. So the difference between each side is just, that's just the way I configured it. Occasionally, it can tell you um, what's what's using a lot, what's making a lot of connections in your network. So, like here, um, if you look at uh, 172.16.7.10, that's the DNS server. Um, so it's sort of it's good for making correlations between what's talking a lot in your network and uh, so what might be using a lot of bandwidth. Are just interesting things to look into. For the most part, I use this just to get people interested and to start a conversation and sort of help us at help for education. Um, I actually, in my replay data set, I, it was the DNS servers were so noisy, I had to filter them out, and I had to filter out the vulnerability scanner. Um, so, anything else? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so can I run multiple instances of this to filter uh, multiple, uh, multiple protocols or? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was if I can basically run multiple instances of this 
at different layers like the OSI layer. Um, as long as you have parsers and a system to gather it, yes, you can. Um, the T Shark parsers could work for that. Um, Bro, I don't think, goes down to the lower levels. Uh, so you just, it only goes down as far as three. And Liam, correct me if I'm wrong on that. All right, good. Uh, but yeah, because all this does is just, if, as long as you have a log, de log file, it can read it. As long as you have a parser that can understand it, it can read it. Um, and the parsers are pretty simple. It's just you specify what each field means, and then you tell it uh, what activity you want to look for. And that act when the thing hits that activity, uh, filter or command, it will generate a dot. Yep. Do you mind the switch from the PCAPs to the bro that you were able to reduce the lag that GLS Hacker Coatail coming into? Um, for the testing I did, Be yeah. So, thank you. Uh, from switching from PCAPs to using bro, was I able to uh, reduce the lag that I had noticed previously? Uh, and from what I've found with the testing I've done at least, uh, yes, I have. Uh, granted, I haven't run it for anywhere near as long as those other ones. Uh, from, I've been able to run my replay stuff for about a half hour to an hour, and as soon as I kill that, uh, GLTEL stops displaying data within about five seconds. Um, so really, just it depends on how much data it's, how fast data is being generated. Yes? Uh, my question is two part. First, do you have any idea what GLTEL is doing it? And the second is, uh, what sort of, how have you experimented scaling GLTEL so that you can get um, near real time, as near real time as possible? Like, what's the most powerful machine you run? Like, All right, so the first question is, do I know what GLTEL is written in? And yes, it's written in Ruby. Uh, it is up on GitHub. Um, and what is the most powerful machine I've run this on so that to figure out sort of scale and stuff like that? Um, unfortunately, right now, the most powerful machine I've run this on is this system right here. <laughs> um, works relatively well until I get uh, a ton of data on here and the frame rate starts dropping. Um, take what you see on the screen and probably double or triple it. Um, it just, it, it comes down to how many connections are happening on the network. Um, so like the center section would be filled with dots to like up here. Um, and maybe the frame will start dropping. Uh, once it's clear, the screen clears out, it'll pick back up again. Do you know where the bottlenecks are? Uh, that particular bottleneck, so that particular bottleneck um, is just in the GPU and process it. Um, some of the other bottlenecks I've had is just purely being able to read the logs fast enough. Anything else? Yeah. So on this, besides the concrete, <laughs> So, all right, so the question being, besides it's looking pretty, how can I use this to sort of, um, um, to actually use this for like a more operational manner? Um, and sort of what does the things at the bottom, like the drain at the bottom represent and the size of the circles represent? So the size of the circles is the um, amount of data transferred uh, according to Bro. Uh, the drain at the bottom is arbitrary, it's just, where it drains off the screen. Um, when a dot appears on the screen is actually when the connection is, when Bro sees the connection close. Um, at least, yeah. Or the, and for some of the logs when the actual connection ha thing happens. Um, for operational, it, it really depends on what you're looking at and what parsers you're using. Um, if you wanna use this on like your web server and have it um, showing either get request, put requests, or based upon what errors you're getting. Uh, it would be helpful if you start seeing a lot of um, uh, 404s or, uh, yeah, just anything for like forbidden or yeah, that type of thing. Have you uh, played with Logstash and Search? 
Have I played with uh, Logstack, Elasticsearch, and Kibana? Not yet. It's on my list. <laughs> yes? So do I think there's a way to fool with formatting so that things like a SID and fun or SID, SIN flood or a MAP scan would really stand out? Uh, yes, completely, because uh, um, how, what side stuff's on is completely configurable. Um, I actually just define it in my, um, just kill this quickly. Um, That one's probably not a good idea to use. <laughs> yeah, I will try to, yes. How's that? Um, top part's just defining what your logs are. Uh, and what color, no, that's just defining what logs are. Uh, yeah, so this, you just, here's where you start specifying where, which side it goes on, uh, what colors there are, um, and what actual event you're trying to pull out the parsers. Anything else on GLTL before I move on? SkyRails. <laughs> SkyRails was a program I found about three, four years ago during labs. Um, looks real nice. Pain in the ass to work with. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. <laughs> so this was his, uh, this Yosha's or his PhD project. Uh, and so what SkyRails does is it visualizes data in 3D space. Um, the camera can move freely throughout the space. Unfortunately, there's no documentation for this program. There's no source code available. Uh, and the scripting language is custom. <laughs> um, and it's quite hard to understand. <laughs> so after about oh, a few years, I was able to at least reverse engineer the scripting language uh, to a point where I could actually Display stuff. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Have you contacted and asked for the source code? Yes, I have. I, I have contacted the developer. He has said no. <laughs> I will go more into that later. <laughs> um, so I've been able to reverse engineer the, script, the scripting language to a point where I can at least display data and do some basic formatting. Um, work. Great with static files, so I can make a script to get everything in the right format, dump it into the script file, into its their Skyro scripting file, and just have it load that static file, and works wonderfully. Um, found out that Skyros does have support for external data sources. Unfortunately, like everything else in the program, it is undocumented. Um, luckily, during StreamCon last year, I was able to find a um, a script that someone had written to interact with it remotely. And all it really does is gives you a remote console, so you still have to feed commands to it, um, just like they would be in a static file. Um, and so with that in hand, I went ahead and made a nice Python script to um, read in the bro data and send it along to SkyRails. All right. Oh, and another unfortunate thing with SkyRails, it only runs in Windows. It does run in Wine and Linux, not always, but and it runs well enough.
All right, and hopefully this works. There we go. Uh, this is just reading the con log from Bro. Uh, each dot represents a system that's being either it's uh, taking part in communication, and the link between them is uh, the arrow for the link between them is just indicating the direction of the communications. Um, there is no, I don't have anything but data sizing or anything like that, but, and the color is just what I picked. And so right now I have my script reading about 2,000 lines um, from the log, and it'll sit here and keep on generating them. Um, so I have talked to the author about releasing the source code for this, um, and his reasoning is that no one uses it, it's such a niche. Uh, he just doesn't see a point in releasing it. And if it does become an interest, he might want to continue working on it. There's no market, but I'm not going to develop a market. Yes. Yes. All right, let me see if I got the question right. <laughs> um, start from the beginning. So what significant advantage, if any, does this or the previous this one. visualization have over like, any D3 visualization right. out there, like Sunrise, Dendogram? All Sunrise. right, so what significant advantage does this data visualization or the one previously have over things like D3, tree map, and yeah, the D3 ones or the Tableau ones? Or yeah, D3, tree map, Tableau. Um, I actually never used them. Uh, it's again on my list. This is I'm still trying to get into the state of visual aid field, and right now I'm just dealing with things that look flashy. Because <laughs> uh, I found that that's at least to uh, the average user, uh, this is much better to get a point across. Um, uh, and things like at least D3 is mainly standard graphs. <coughs> is D3 mainly standard graphs? Right. Everything from bar charts to fancy yourself like sunburst, zoom with little sunburst, tree maps, pentagrams, core diagrams, coronary diagrams. All right. Anything else? All right. Yeah, so that's mainly the reason why I've been using these, these particular tools, mainly just because they're flashy. There's other ones I've used that are also flashy, uh, but yeah. Jacob. <laughs> Right now, right now you just drift through it and experience it. Uh, to give an example of what it, this thing can do, let me stop the live data and go to some of the can scripts. For sky rails. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, the one thing I've noticed with using SkyRails at least is it makes things like scanners really show up like a sore thumb uh, because they just become a bloom, um, at least if they run fast. Um, I haven't really, so this is actually the first time I've shown SkyRails because I've only got the thing working with Maxional Scripts about uh, four months ago. Um, For me, SkyRails is just something that looks cool. Uh, throw some moveables if you like, but uh, but to go back with Jacob's question is sort of the how to filter down this data. So at least with the pre-can scripts, um, it has this little menu down below, which you again have to define the scripting language, and it allows you to define times and stuff. It can be filtered, or you can filter it down with your the script you're using to input the data. Uh, yes, Taylor. Two questions. One um, is: Does the do the links disappear after a certain period of time, or once a connection is made, does it 
automatically just stays within the graph. So the question is whether or not the links disappear after a certain period of time or once they're made, they stay there. Um, for the stuff I'm using, they stay there until I clear, the, until I clear it. Um, it might be possible to get rid of them after, after a certain period of time. I don't know how to do that yet. Um, yeah, because at this point, I read in 2,000 or n lines. And after it's done, if I have it set up to loop, if I have my script set up to loop, it will send the command to clear the project and the startup forget. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the question is whether or not, given the amount of time I spent on this reverse engineering it, have I thought about sort of actually documenting it uh, and giving it back to the community? Uh, the answer is yes, I have. Um, I haven't done it yet. Um, and so, well, it actually gets into my next slide. Um, sure, I just did this. I am going to be releasing all my code. So all the parsers I made, all the, uh, and the script I used for SkyRails are all going up in GitHub. They will be in that repository. They're not there yet. Um, the goal is to have them up there probably either tonight or tomorrow. Um, you can get to me via through the HoneyNet project, um, wide different methods. All right. Anyone have any questions? Yes. So it looks like you're feeding a lot of like, real time raw data. Yes. Um I haven't looked at that yet. So have I looked into taking I've been looking at mainly using um, live data. Have I looked at taking aggregate data and um, doing basically a more comprehensive uh, analysis of the visualization of that? Um, again, on my list. <laughs> I don't have a lot of time for this stuff. I got to wear a lot of hats. But yeah, it's on my list, stuff to do, and sort of in my learning process through data visualization. Uh, anything else? What? Yes? It's, uh, so how, for GLTL, how extensive is the current, like, partial support? Um, relatively extensive, and so you can take anything, most major services, there's a protocol supported for it. As far as how hard it is to add it, it really depends on what you're trying to get out of it. Um, you can generally look at, any of the existing parsers and sort of get an idea of how to make add things. So, anything else? All right, and then shameless plug. Hanet Project is uh, running a workshop in Norway in May. Interested? Come see us. Okay.